Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's afternoon devotional and Bible study. My cat is rubbing along the tripod, but yeah, his name is Joxer, and he just kind of wants attention and to be carried and held like he does. Um, yeah, so today we're going to be reading through First uh, uh, Samuel chapter 13. And we're going to be reading Jesus is calling for today. Uh, there has been a lot of fire trucks and stuff like that zooming past my house. So uh, I just finished lifting them up in prayer and hopefully things go good. All right, Jackson, I'm going to put you back down and then we're going to get to reading. Okay. All right. Yeah. Rah. All right. So Jesus is calling for January 29th, 2021. All right, bud. No, no, no. You're going to knock that down. All right. Uh, keep your focus on me. I have gifted you with amazing freedom, including the ability to choose the focal point of your mind. Only the crown of my creation has such a remarkable capability. This is a sign of being made in my image. Let the goal of this day be to bring every thought captive to me. Whenever your mind wanders, lasso uh, those thoughts and bring them into my presence. In my radiant light, anxious thoughts shrink and shrivel away. Judgmental thoughts are unmasked as you bask in my unconditional love. Confused areas are untangled while you rest in the simplicity of my peace. I will guard you and keep you in constant peace as you focus your mind on me. And that was inspired by four different sections of the Bible. Um, the first is, you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor, Psalms 8.5. And then, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock, over all the earth and over all creation that moves along the ground. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And then we demolish arguments and every uh, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.5 And then lastly, you will guard him and keep him in perfect and consistent peace, whose mind is both in inclination and in its character. It stayed on you because he commits himself to you, leans on you, and hopes confidently in you. Isaiah 26.3 but, um, yeah, uh, this kind of rings through. The unmasking of selfish thoughts, I think, is a pretty big one. Um, today, I was in a little bit of rush. I had to make a, an appointment. And um, I was trying to get out of my driveway. And uh, this one car put on its turning signal and turned into Freshco too late for me to actually pull out in front of it. And I was just like, are you serious? Like, you saw me here, and I, for, like, a good 10, 15 seconds, I was angry at that car because, like, it put on its turning signal so late that I couldn't react and do what I needed to do. And then I was like, wait a second. They probably weren't paying attention to the fact that I was trying to get out of my driveway. They just saw a van parked at the end of a driveway, right? Um... And uh, then they uh, were kind of like, oh, okay, I'm going to turn now. And it wasn't actually a bad thing. And that selfish thought, um, I was able to unmask it and be like, all right, cool. God, I'm sorry. I give it up to you. Uh, how do I get on the stream? I should, if you're seeing me, you're on the stream. Um, I am not too sure how to help you with that like it's just a live video um so if you can hear me you're on it 
Uh, I don't know uh, how else to help you there, Gabe. Um, but uh, if you're talking about something more than just this video, then um, uh, I could connect you. But yes, uh, right now we're just doing that and you can read along with. Um, uh, hi, Ryan. How's it going? Uh, we're going to be opening up our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 13. Um, and I encourage you to read along with me, whether that's on uh, thebiblegateway.com uh, or the Bible app or on a physical Bible. All are great uh, ways of reading along. I'm reading out of something called the New Living Translation. Uh, just if you're wondering why um, what I'm reading and what you're reading might not uh, be gelled. The Bible is translated into many different translations. So. Without uh, further ado, uh, let's uh, start reading. Um, oh, well, I guess I'll, I'll give you a bit of backstory in case you weren't here the last couple of days. Uh, Saul has been crowned king, and um, the Amorites were capturing and plucking out uh, the right eyes of the Israelites. And um, Saul was like, all right, cool. I... Am going to defeat them, and uh, we are going to defeat them. God's people are going to defeat them. God is going to defeat the Amorites, and that's what happened. And then people were like, "All right, cool. Well, it's time uh, then to kill the people that question Saul as king." And Saul's like, "No, no, no. We're not going to do that. Today is going to be a celebration day." Um, and like Saul didn't believe it himself. Really, it took time, and Saul understood that. And then in uh, same in First Samuel twelve, uh, Samuel gives a farewell address, and uh, he basically goes, "Hey, God's brought you out of this, and then we as a people turned from God, and then He brought us out. He heard our cries, and He brought us out of that, and then He turned away from God, and that's a pattern that's been happening throughout the Old Testament. And then finally, uh, he's like, and now you wanted." A physical king. Saul's your physical king. But you turned your back on God again. Because God was your king. But just because you sin there like that, God is not going to abandon you. Just remember to stay focused on God. And that's pretty much, that kind of sums up his farewell speech. So now, uh, we're going to go back into uh, the war uh, and the battles. And yeah. Uh, First Samuel chapter 13, verse 1. <clears throat> Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 42 years. Saul selected 3,000 special troops from the army of Israel and sent the rest of the men home. He took 2,000 of the chosen men with him to Mechmash, in the hill country of Bethel. Another 1,000 went with Saul's son, Jonathan, to get back, get back, and to the land of Benjamin. Um, I'm going to pause. I don't know if you guys can hear it or not, but there's a train going by my house, and it's kind of deafening. Um, so we'll continue from verse 3 in a second. Um, but in the meantime, hello, Ryan. And hello, Nicole. Welcome. All right. It seems like it may have passed now. Hopefully you guys didn't hear that. And it just sounded like I took pause for no reason. But continuing from verse 3. Soon after this, Jonathan attacked and defeated the garrison of Philistine at Gieb. The news spread quickly among the Philistines. So Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land, saying, Hebrews, hear us. Rise up in revolt. All Israel heard the news that Saul had destroyed the Philistine garrison at Gibeah. Gibeah. And that the Philistines now hated the Israelites more than ever. So the entire Israelite army was summoned to join Saul at Gilgah. The Philistine mustered a mighty army of 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, 
and as many warriors as the grains of sand on the seashore. They camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. The men of Israel saw that a tight spot um, saw what a tight spot they were in, and because they were hard pressed by the enemy, they tried to hide in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and cisterns. Some of them crossed the Jordan River and escaped into the land of Gad and Gil Gilead. Saul's disobedient and Samuel's rebuke. Meanwhile, Saul stayed at Gilead, Gilgath, sorry, and his men were trembling with fear. Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel still didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly splitting away, so he demanded, Bring me the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, and Saul sacrificed the burnt offerings himself. Just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offerings, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet and welcome him. But Samuel said, What is it that you have done? Saul responded, I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would, and the Philistines are at Michmash, ready for battle. So I said, The Philistines are ready uh, to march against us at Gilgal. Sorry, Gilgal. And I haven't even asked for the Lord's help. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offerings myself before you came. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the command the Lord God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end. For the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Israel's military disadvantage. Samuel then left Gilgal and went on his way, but the rest of the troops went with Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibach in the land of Benjamin. When Saul counted the men who were still with him, he found only 600 were left. Saul and Jonathan and the troops with them were staying at Gibach. In the land of Benjamin, the Philistines set up their camp at Michmash. Three raiding parties soon left the camp of the Philistines. One went north toward Ophrah in the land of Shal. Another went west to Beth Horon. And the third moved towards the border above the valley of Z Zimbom near the wilderness. There were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel in those days. The Philistines wouldn't allow them for fear they would make swords and spears for the Hebrews. So whenever the Israelites needed to sharpen their plowshares, picks, axes, or shekels, they had to take them to the Philistine blacksmiths. The charges were as follows. A quarter of an ounce of silver for sharpening a plowshare or pick and an eighth of an ounce for sharpening an axe or making the point of an axe god, goad. So on the day of the battle, none of the people of Israel had a sword or spear, except for Saul and Jonathan. The pass at Michmash had meanwhile been secured by con a contagion of the Philistine, by a cont contagion, not like a spreading a disease, but like, a group of the Philistine army. I don't know why that word is so hard for me to say, but it was. All right. So there we are. We're setting the stage again. Um, and uh, may God add a blessing to the reading of his word, uh, for sure. So First Samuel 13. So uh, in this, we have um, the, the battles and the wars now that they've entered into by getting this king are growing. Uh there's a lot of people kind of gathering around and, um, you know, there's a target on their head as there also is a target on them as they've now entered into uh, the affairs of the world. And as they're doing this, that and the other, uh, Saul goes against um, one of the things that God asked him not to do. And he ends up doing it. And Samuel goes, OK, when the going gets tough, you're not relying on God. God needs someone that's going to rely on him when the going gets tough. 
that's why he appointed you here. He he did that. Now all the people look towards you because you, like you are that physical specimen. But your heart's been now corrupted by the power that you wield. So God's gonna raise someone else up. And once again, things are looking bleak. Israelites don't have weapons. They, in order to get weapons, they have to go to their enemies in order to get their weapons to be made and to be sharpened and to be used. All their farming equipment needed to be used. So the only people with weapons are the king and the prince right now. It's Saul and Jonathan. Those are the only two people with weapons. They basically got sticks and pitchforks and everything that's sharp the enemy has been providing for them. This does not look like a winnable scenario. So, um, and this is setting up for something to come, but Saul did what he thought was best, and he leaned on his own understanding and not on God's, and it ended up costing him. We've also seen that time and time again throughout the Old Testament, where God made a promise, and then people tried to solve it themselves. People saw a problem, and they're like, cool, we'll fix it this way, using what we know. Uh, later on, Jesus says, lean not on your own understanding, but and your ways are not my ways, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, sometimes when we try to force a solution, we need to make sure that we're walking with God, not against God. And that can be a very dangerous thing. So if God gives a clear plan and he's like, wait and I will rescue you, then wait to be rescued. Don't find a way to do it yourself. Um, and that can be a challenging thing. It can be a hard thing to do. Um, but we've seen how it's been good. And once again, you know, with Candace, um, God said, wait, and it'll be good. And it took eight years of waiting, but eventually... Uh, she became the one that I was to marry and I became the husband, the man that she was to marry. Um, but that waiting period can be challenging when God says to, Hey, to wait, wait on God. Cause we're so used to things being done so instantaneously, uh, to wait for God to execute his plan. Sometimes, um, it's, it goes against our sinful nature. Sometimes it can be very challenging. Um, so anyways, uh, let's uh, pray, and uh, then I'll let you guys get going uh, with your Friday. Sorry. All right. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. I accidentally started something <laughs> in my ear. Uh, all right. AJC, awesome Jesus Christ. Thank you so much uh, for your word, uh, for that reminder that we can trust you in every situation when we feel like um, there's uh, nothing left that we can do. You are nothing. That you are what we can rely on in the bleakest of situations. As there's an army approaching and they got sticks and stones. But we know sticks and stones can still break bones and that you are in control of everything. As we're looking at things logically. We might not see a way out, but Lord, you know a way out. Let us lean not on our own understanding, but lean on you because our your ways are not our ways. That your ways are higher, they're better, and you love us so much. You don't. Your plans aren't for us to harm us, but to give us a hope, to give us a future. Let us rely on you and your promises. As you fulfilled promise after promise after promise, when we stop and we look back and we see how you've been involved in our lives. When we're facing an army with better weapons, more people, more military strategy. When we're facing unknowns that are trying to deceive us and distract us, may we stay focused on you because that is the only sure way a victory. And I thank you for the victory that we have in you.
Well, thank you guys very much. Have a fantastic day. It is Friday. So uh, tomorrow uh, we'll read 14 and then we'll take a break. And I'll encourage you guys to check out a local church on Sunday. But for now, have a great day. God bless. See you tomorrow.